In this video, I want to talk about evidence for evolution. Now, direct evidence for evolution comes from paleontology, as I've talked about before. That's the study of fossils, okay, paleontology. Uh, fossils are usually found in sedimentary rock, as I mentioned, so that's direct evidence for evolution. Okay. Um, how does it show this? Well, basically, here we go. Um, here are some of the reasons why. Um, increasing through the increasing number of species in a fossil in the fossil record. I'll explain these shortly. Increasing complexity of species over time. And also um, aquatic to terrestrial. And the presence of transitional forms. Transitional forms. Let me describe what these are. So here are some good um, um, some good evidence for why evolution uh, in nature exists. Increasing number of species in a fossil record. Okay, so as you go back in time, you get more. Uh, sorry, you get more um, species that have existed. Okay, and as you know, that day by day, hundreds hundreds of species get extinct. Okay, so that's evidence number one. Number two, increasing complexity of species over time. So as um, over time species become more and more complex, they evolve into different things. Uh, for example, a little blob in the ocean can become a lizard, say, onto the land. Aquatic to terrestrial is another one. Okay, so fish growing, um, say, wings to become land creatures or lizards. Okay, uh, and another one, presence of transitional forms, things transitioning, changing from one form to another. And I'll talk about these uh, soon. It's a different color. Okay. Point number one is increasing number of species, okay? Now, early fossils are fairly simple, okay? Later ones are increasingly complex. That's basically, that's basically it. So early fossils equals simple. Uh, later ones equals complex, okay? And it makes sense, okay, in terms of genetics because new alleles and genes develop from existing ones by well, mutations, right? Number one. Number two, uh, increasing complexity of species over time. Okay, uh, many became extinct, right? As I mentioned, you can even look it up on the um, on Google. It shows you like a live, uh, a world clock showing how many species are being extinct by the um, second even. So many become uh, extinct along the way. Typical example, dinosaurs. Okay, they become extinct. And species continually split into two or more okay, over time. It also supports uh, evolution. Number three, uh, aquatic versus uh, aquatic to terrestrial. Um, I can talk, uh, that's basically um, linked to number four, okay, transitional forms. Now, what are transitional forms? Okay, these provide the links uh, between a group of organisms, let's say vertebrates, vertebrates. Um, and how they moved from sea to land, okay? So, uh, provide the links between a group of organisms, example vertebrates, okay, like reptiles, birds and mammals, vertebrates. Um, and this um, suggests a way in which, it also suggests a way in which um, organisms moved from land from sea to land. Okay, is uh, an example. You should sort of know a low-finned fish. Okay, this is a sea to land scenario. Okay, it was part fish and also um, part amphibian. Okay, so lobe finned fish. You've also got the, if I can spell it, sorry, archaeo, um, archaeopteryx, archaeopteryx, okay, 
Um, it's basically a small dinosaur with feathers. Okay, small dinosaur with feathers. Okay, part um, the vertebrate sort of part. Uh, sorry, part um, part bird, part mammal. Okay, so these two examples you should commit to memory. Archaeopteryx and lobefin fish. Okay. So there are the different types of evidence. Let me now talk about comparative anatomy. Okay, and I think straight away you might know what this is, what this is referring to, okay? It compares the structure of organisms, their anatomy, okay? Their body parts of both living species and fossils, okay? So it compares um, structures of organisms of both of both living species and fossils. Okay, it provides indirect evidence of the evolution. Okay, indirect uh, evidence for evolution. Okay, from a common ancestor. Now, homologous structures fit into this category. Remember, homologous means the same, same structures fit in this category of comparative anatomy. Okay, what's an example? I talked about before the pentadactyl limbs. Okay, they provide strong evidence for evolution from a single vertebrate ancestor. Okay, why is this the case? Pentadactyl means, penta means five, right? So five um, digits on the limb. Here's some examples. A horse, right, he uses it for running as a leg. A whale uses it as a fin. Okay, you got five digits, bone-like things inside a fin. A bat uses it for flying, okay? So it's got big digits, a wing. And monkeys use it for gripping things with, okay? They've got hands. Let me now talk about biogeography as evidence for evolution. Okay, it's basically the study of the geographic distribution of plants, animals, and other forms of life. Okay, bio, life, geography, uh, geography, okay, distrib um, locations. Okay, here's an example we should uh, commit to memory. The distribution of Glossopteris. Okay, this is actually a, a species of Waratah. Waratahs, as you know, they're common to Australia. Okay, they're basically pink, reddish, really bright pink um, shrubs. Okay. And that's, um, it's basically um, the New South Wales state emblem. Okay, so if, if you look at your parents' driver's license, or if you have a driver's license, you'll be able to see it there, like mine. Um, so the distribution of uh, loss of terrace on isolated islands, they support the proposed method of evolution by natural selection. Okay, evolution from a common ancestor. Okay, it's native, also native to southern parts, uh, south to the southeastern parts of New South Wales, Victoria, and uh, Tasmania. It produces it reproduces by seeds. Okay, and the distribution of this plant was actually amongst the first evidence for continental drift. So one of first evidence of continental drift, which is the drifting of continents, okay, large scale movement of continents relative to each other. It's now not only found in Australia, but it's also found in Brazil, India, and South Africa too. It's also found in Brazil and South America, India, and South Africa, for example, which suggests that it had a common ancestor, okay, maybe back in Australia, because the continents were once together and they separated. That's an example of a piece of evolution. Evidence. So that's biogeography. Let me now talk about comparative embryology. And I think this will ring a bell as well. Comparative 
embryology. Okay, embryo is uh, the, st the stage of a baby's life. Okay, comparative comparing embryos. Okay, basically the development of um, embryos, development of embryos. Okay, that's further evidence for evolution. I should have written it here, sorry. So comparative embryology is study of comparison of embryos of different species. That's comparative embryology. Now the German biologist uh, Ernest, so German biologist Ernest Haeckel, that's how you say it, he proposed by that examining, so by examining um, an embryo, you could see, you could see its entire evolutionary history as it developed from one stage to another. Okay, so similarities are present, you can see that. Uh, the early stages of all vertebrate embryos okay, are very similar. So example, uh, vertebrate embryos. Embry embryos. Okay, early human embryo resembled a fish. Um, it had gills, okay, slits. Um, it had a tail and a fish-like heart and kidney. And then later, embryo, human embryos had um, like a reptile-like structure with a kidney and heart. Came later on the hair, and the uh, baby um, became ape-like. Okay, so if I draw this, let's say the fins. Okay, so it supports the common ancestor theory for evolution. Okay, so fish-like, fish like here with the gills, a tail, okay, as well and fish-like heart and kidney, then it became reptile-like, so the, th so the theory goes, and reptile-like, and then eventually became ape-like, until we get a human-looking thing. And that's comparative embryology.